Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, kind of as a review, last week we talked about how service is love. It's not just something we do on our own. We love because he, Jesus, first loved us. And service, from the the New Testament's perspective, always involves both God and uh, the people around us. Well, today we talk about how our whole lives are service, uh, particularly how God wants us to use our bodies for service. Our reading from Paul and one of his close companions, Luke, uh, revealed this. Luke, if you recall, was a, a doctor, and as a doctor, it's not surprising that he's kind of more attuned to the body. He, he'll, for instance, describe sometimes in more detail the medical conditions of those Jesus healed. Uh, or in, in particularly talking about service with the body, it reminds me of in Acts where uh, Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And the lame man walk, stands up, but he doesn't just do that. He starts jumping and leaping and praising God. His whole body is responding with worship. Um, both Paul and Jesus will teach that service is about the body, and it certainly includes our bodies as primary tools through which we can serve others. Um, and that's, that's a part, I think, of, that sometimes gets overlooked in religious circles or in, maybe in, you know, in church. We forget about how God is, our body is our primary tool uh, with which to serve and live for others. It's not just about theology as much as I love it, um, but it's about our bodies and God using our lives. Our gospel lesson reminds us of the really radical nature of service Christians are called to. Now, most reasonable people agree that it's good to serve others, to, to be kind and helpful. It's not exactly controversial to say that. However, you know, it's sort of a, a gut check when we look at what Jesus says uh, about the kind of c- service Christians are called to. Um, love your enemies? Well, that's a lot easier said than done. I mean, none of us, myself included, likes to be taken advantage of. I don't like it even when someone's talking behind my back. I, I'm much more likely to want to get back at people who mock me than to help them. If I'm, and if I'm threatened physically, I certainly don't want to do something nice. I either want to, maybe I want to run away or I want to fight, uh, but I certainly don't want to suffer or help them typically. But Jesus tells us not just to avoid fighting back, which is kind of hard enough on its own. He tells us to go a step further. He tells us to share willingly, even with those who take advantage of us. Luke gets down to the physical detail, saying if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to them the other. Uh, And he's talking particularly about suffering for the sake of the gospel. Why would Jesus tell us to do this? Well, it's because the gospel and God's people, he, he wants us to stand out. He wants the, the radical nature of the good news of the kingdom of God to be recognized. And our bodies and lives, the way we live, plays uh, an absolutely essential part of that. Uh, it starts, of course, we want to start with Jesus. It starts with the radical compassion and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross Uh, But likewise, our own bodies, and even when we suffer for the sake of Christ and the gospel, can be a powerful way that we witness to the world. Uh, Jesus came, and he came to to go against the grain, to fight um, violence with suffering for love's sake. Uh, He fought selfishness with concern for others. He told people to give and to live without expecting to be repaid. That's really very different from the way we're inclined to live and the way much of the world lives. But all that, all that teaching is just a bunch of empty theology or philosophy unless someone actually lives it out. I mean, we can say whatever we want to about how Christians ought to live, uh, but until we actually do it, no one cares. Um, but that's exactly, of course, what our Savior did and what he calls us to do. Although he didn't advocate for violence, Jesus nevertheless did wage war with the world. He came to battle with evil, sin, and death, 
and he wrestled it in the, in the cross and, and into the grave, and he emerged victorious on Easter. What I'm trying to get at is talk is cheap, and certainly I'm probably guilty of it sometimes as a theologian, but the world says, show me a radical way to live. Don't just tell me, and maybe I'll dare to trust in it. But again, if it's just a bunch of words, no thanks. I can find that somewhere else. But, but when we actually start to, of course, I'm perfectly and needing forgiveness along the way, but when we actually start to, to live this out, and, um, and instead of just talking about it, when I, we put our bodies in service to God, not, um, it can actually, that's when people will actually take note. So that's our gospel as a knowledge shift to the Apostle Paul. And Paul talks about the body pretty regularly. He talks about disciplining the body, um, comparing on several occasions, comparing this discipline of the body to an athlete. Um, the physical body matters very, very much to Paul. In fact, one of the main things he has to argue with is the idea that the bodies, eh, they don't really matter. Um, he often has to argue with those who, who think Christianity is just a philosophy on life uh, and, and who think, well, we can believe whatever we want and then we can do whatever we want even if we believe it. If we, if we subscribe to this Christianity thing, well, I can still just kind of do my own thing. But Paul really vehemently rejects this idea. Instead, he talks about our, our whole bodies being in service to God, uh, not just some separate, separate part of life from the physical world. Romans chapter 12 talks about using our lives, and, and it views them as a sacrifice. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, Jesus doesn't, he's not asking for us to set aside some time or some portion of our money to serve others. No, what he wants to redefine the whole purpose of our life. Paul calls us into not just to section off our life into different segments, he wants the good news of Jesus to affect all of us, including body, heart, and mind. He wants being a Christian and following Jesus to affect how we approach school or work, friends, family, even our own lives and free time. See, for Christians, service isn't just something we do. Jesus tells us that service is actually part of who we are. Serving others was certainly part of Christ's identity, and it's part of our identity too. Now, sometimes the, the difficult part of that is it requires sacrifice. It means, and sacrifice, sacrifice means giving something up. Sometimes we have to give things up. Sometimes it means denying ourselves things we would otherwise enjoy or indulge in. That often goes against the grain of our sinful nature. It goes against the grain of what uh, the devil tempts us to do, and certainly of what the sinful flesh wants us to do as well. Um, even, our, even those close to us, even sometimes even our friends and family may think it's silly or foolish to live without looking out for number one, myself, above all else. However, a life of service is not really a burden. It's a privilege. It's, it's freeing because life isn't all about you and me because God's plans are are better than our plans. And the wonderful news of the gospel is that Jesus takes care of us. He promises that we don't have to worry or fret because he's got our back. He'll take care of us. Now, I'm sure, I imagine maybe many of you are like me and that we have to admit we don't always do this. But I'll tell you, my regrets are not the times when I did what Jesus said. I don't regret that. Or rather, I regret and confess that at times I am guilty of living for myself, of not taking, for not making my whole life a testimony and sacrifice to Jesus, because I know that what Jesus offers is better than what I have to offer. Yet, I, like I said, I have experienced, and I know that Jesus calls us um, to a, a better way. It's not just better in the sense that it's what you're supposed to do, but it's actually better 
for us and for others when we live it out. As Paul said elsewhere, as he describes our purpose and, and also some very familiar verses, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, let us close with prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for the bodies that you have given to us. Forgive us for being selfish and often using these bodies according to our wishes and desires instead of living sacrificially and fulfilling the purpose for which you created us. Have mercy on us and lead us so that we may enjoy and delight in your will and walk in your ways according to your holy name. Amen.